Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club the podcast, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, uh, wishing you a 2022 full of love and maybe romance. Oh, yeah, we've got a theme going here. So we are bringing in our special guest, uh, and he is, he's an expert. <laughs> I don't I'll let him say whether he's an expert in romance or not. He's an expert, at the very least, in romance books. He is a, a bookseller with Changing Hands Bookstore in Arizona. And uh, Tim, some people, as they're shopping for books, get to know you as Uncle Tim, thanks to your videos introducing uh, romance novels and why guys should be reading romance. So, uh, Tim... I'm choking on the, our pronunciation of our last name, which we just went through. <laughs> so okay. give it to me, Tim, and say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Tim Sayasamut. I'm a bookseller here at Changing Hands, and I am the romance, the designated romance expert at here at Changing Hands. <laughs> you know, pressure's on you. I mean, I can't imagine if you are uh, setting up a little date and you're looking up this guy. It's like, oh, he's the romance expert. Okay, this guy knows what's going on. So uh, get ready here. Um, as I understand it, prior to 2019-ish or so, romance, reading romance was not your thing. It was not my thing. No, it was, uh, so it was like 2019. One of my reading resolutions was to read outside of my comfort zone. I was normally like a science fiction fantasy. And then one of my colleagues at Changing Hands, um, she handed me a book called Bromance Book Club, which is written by Lisa K. Adams. Uh, she handed it to me because she was like, the men in here remind me of you. And I was like, well, I was like, okay, well, I got to read this to see if it's a compliment or an insult. And luckily it was a compliment because I really enjoyed the book. So that was kind of my first foray into the romance genre. And it's the one that I've like come to often, especially over the last like two years since the pandemic started. So the the storyline to this book really does kind of parallel, or, or it's a it's it's a good intro for a man who's not used to reading romance because it's about a dude who's not necessarily used to reading romance or thinking about those things like a real a real alpha male ish type of guy, and then he ends up in a book club, right? Correct. Yeah, it's about a man named Gavin who is jo who's joined the secret romance book club in order to learn uh, more about his relationship and where he messed up. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is something to the idea of reading romance that if most men aren't doing it, you, you pick up a couple of these books, it's kind of a cheat sheet into what women, the way that women tell romance, the way that we envision a romantic relationship or being swept off our feet or what goes wrong or what we're really looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like a manual in a way, for sure. Um, you can, uh, I would say, I, I, won't, I don't wanna say it's a direct correlation to my relationships or anything, but it's definitely helped me made, uh, be more empathetic, I guess. Um, especially towards women and their betrayal in the media. Uh, we hear that term, the male gaze, right? Where women are often sexualized in order to satisfy a male demographic. But the thing in romance novels is that it's the female gaze, right? It's often the men that are, it's flipped around, right? It's the men that are objectified. And that may, may feel, uh, that might make people feel some type of way. But you got to understand that women kind of get this in pretty much every other form of media and entertainment, you know? Doing, you are basically uh, a servant for the community. I mean, you were doing good work by recommending these books. Are you surprised or are, I guess you are getting a lot of kind of surprised response to your recommendations and as people are wandering and, and for those who are listening to this podcast uh, from elsewhere, we're based in Arizona, Changing Hands Bookstores has two locations in the Valley and, and it's been around since like 1974. So really mm -hmm. like the kind of cool bookstore spot that you like to wander around. And those are the stores where we love to see what the staff's recommending because you guys are all voracious readers. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what my colleagues have told me is that sometimes they'll kind of be about in the store and they'll see a couple, a man, a man and a woman or whatever, uh, in the romance section. And the woman's like, I like this book. And would you ever read it? 
and the guys to be like, oh no, that's a romance book. And then one of my colleagues will over here and be like, hey, there is a guy here that reads romance and he loves it. And then they show him all my staff recs and it's pretty much just half of it's just my staff recs. So, um, <laughs> but to me, I never saw it as a huge thing when I first started, it was just me reading books. It wasn't until I, I read them openly, like in the break room or something like that. People were like, hey, that's awesome, Tim. And I, I didn't see it as a huge deal. But if it's a way to normalize re uh, men reading romance books, then, hey, I'll take the street cred for it and I'll talk it up as much as I can, you know? <laughs> yes. You may have saved a relationship or you may have helped somebody come across the story that transformed them from being an absolute jerk to a decent human being that could possibly be in a relationship. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, it might, <laughs> who knows? It might help somebody out there. <laughs> so um, I know we have a couple of books that you wanted to uh, recommend that 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 you have enjoyed in the romance genre. Let me first ask you though, I don't often read romance, and I, I'm starting to enjoy it more now. But I think what I did not appreciate about it before and I want you to explain why you think this is actually a good thing is romance readers know how the story ends we are getting that hea or it's not technically romance right a happily ever after so I think um when I would come to those books I'd be like meh you know I want to know I, I like books that maybe you know somebody is going to you know go off the edge and and kill somebody or you know like just leave and be lonely and heartbroken forever or whatever so when you know what's coming tell me about the what you find so enjoyable and joyful and interesting about the journey to that destination yeah, it's definitely a comfort thing for me. I think they're predictable enough to be comforting since you, like, as you said, you know, it's going to be a happy ending. These two are going to be together at the end of it. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of the fulfillment comes through um, its character growth rather than through its plot elements. You know that these two are going to eventually fall in love. You just got to see how they got, they fall in love. You know, you want them to be together, but they kind of have to go through some things before so that they can earn it. You know, a lot of that come, that's where the satisfaction comes from. It's the same reason why we watch like romantic comedies, you know, 10 Things I Hate About You, um, Sleepless in Seattle, Clueless. A lot of these people find comfort in that. And especially since the pandemic hit, it's, it's the genre that I've kind of gravitated towards. And it kind of just makes you smile too. And you're right. No book, if, if they start out completely ready for love and, and primed to be accepting of themselves or other people or, you know, not held back by anything, there's no book. So there is going to be a big old arc to get to the space where the two people who obviously um, are going to end up together end up together. But you're still on on a journey that can be very enjoyable and often pretty enlightening. Yeah, weirdly enough, it's kind of like watching those detective shows, like something like Law and Order or A Monk or something like that, where you know they're going to solve the crime at the end of it, but it's the journey that that takes you there. That's the satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So romance has, and I, I have, know a few of writers in the genre, and, and I love to hear about kind of what it is that the readers expect and some of the spaces where these stories really thrive. So there's a few like tropes that are very common in, in romance, or I'm sure there's many, many um, the, the, that I don't know, but what are some of your favorites? Like, is it that, I mean, you know, the, the, what, are, what are like the, the little subcategories in romance that you dig the most? So yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to kind of go into like my recommendations because what yeah. I have for you is kind of like a starter kit for, uh, based on different tropes. So this is perfect. So first off, we're going to do, we got the X talk written by Rachel and Solomon. This is what we're going to categorize as enemies to lovers. And it's pretty much what's, what, what the word is, is like these, these people are going to start off as enemies and then they'll eventually come as lovers. Usually it's something like small, like they're a business rival or something like that. In the X talk, they're actually two rival radio hosts. Um, it revolves around public radio and these two have to come together in order to save their jobs. Uh, to start up a new show called The X Talk, which is about two exes that are going to deliver relationship advice by criticizing their own past relationships. The problem is these two producers have never been in a relationship with each other. So they have to make this up. So they have to make this up as they go. So now that's where the drama is coming from. 
Um, so it's kind of like a love letter. It's, a, it's filled with nostalgia for like the golden era of media with a special focus on public broadcast radio. And that's going to be your enemies to lovers. And people typically like that. that. Uh, people and typically just... like that stuff because of the banter and, and the sassiness that kind of comes with it. And obviously there's a lot of character development here, right? Because these two start off hating each other, but they're eventually going to get together. We, we all know it. <laughs> So, and that's something we love seeing play out in the movies, right? Like somebody being on their nerves right away or like, oh, that person is so impossible. And then, you know, of course they they get there. So I'm thinking like Emily Henry's Beach Read, which was also the two writers of mm-hmm. staying in the houses next to each other and getting so, oh, she was just, yeah. you know, hit off on the wrong note altogether. And you're thinking, of course, this is the romantic interest. And uh, so at X Talk also, uh, Margaret, who is part of this podcast and does recommendations, that was one of her recommendations a while ago too. So we are doubly endorsing the X Talk, which is, which is, means I got to move it up my list. Okay, oh, on to the next. On to the next, we have, the Kiss Quotient, written by Helen Huang. So this is what we're going to categorize as fake dating, right? This is uh, two people, they're going to be in a relationship, but it's strictly like a business transaction. They set up contracts, they they set up these rules, mostly because they don't want to catch feelings with each other. They mostly want something out of each other, right? In terms of the Kiss Quotient, Stella Lane is a, uh, Stella Lane creates algorithms to predict customer purchases, and she's really into like math and STEM. However, because she has Asperger's, she has an insane worth ethic uh, to which she has no dating experience. So she does what any rational person would do. She hires, her, she hires a male escort to teach her the ways of being in a relationship and being intimate. <laughs> Well, how else would you how else would you learn the ropes? <laughs> I know, right? If, if only it was that easy, right? <laughs> Well, I guess technically it is, maybe, who knows? Oh, who but knows? okay, yeah, that is interesting. I like it. Yeah, and so fake dating is very interesting. You kind of want to see like how it's going to play out, right? And just Definitely. because it's kind of like a ridiculous scenario about well, like, fake dating, but it's the same thing, like those 90 romantic comedies, the, 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 the plots are always unpredictable and crazy, but you know, that's why we love them. Fake dating. Okay. I'm I'm into it. And that's also where, you know, the, the stories of like when somebody is needing to go to a wedding and the family's been expecting them to be in a relationship or whatever, or they've got to show that they have somebody else because they're going to run into the ex. And inevitably that just happens to be somebody they're going to have chemistry with. Oh yeah. See, you know how it goes down for sure. (laughs) Okay. And your next recommendation All right, last but not least, we finally have The Right Swipe by Alicia Ray. This is uh, Second Chances. This is what we're going to call. So this is revolving around the ones that got away, the ones where they tried it the first time, it just didn't work out. Maybe they were in a different place uh, in their life at the time. But The Right Swipe follows Re, who's a successful app developer, and she's basically created what is essentially like Twitter slash Bumble, right? And she has a business opportunity However, she must work with a man named Samson Lima, a former professional football player. And he is also an old flame of Ree and actually ghosted her out of, out of the blue. So this is their first time seeing each other for the, like maybe 10 years or so. So already you have that tension there because they have shared history. And second chances is always um, interesting, right? Because we always wonder what if it actually worked out or not or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, It also allows the characters to kind of acknowledge their feelings and be honest about what went wrong. And we see these comparisons to, you know, their first relationship compared to how it is now and their maturity and seeing if they get a second chance or not, see if it happens. Love hearing you talk about these books. Have you, now that you've, become such a fan of this genre are you still enjoying your like the sci-fi and the fantasy space as much and do you see I mean does it does it like lend you to look at stories in different way or is it like you know you're going to a buffet and you want a little bit of everything oh for sure I'm definitely I it's definitely um my reading habits are definitely diverse still I'm still reading my romance novels. What I usually do, they're a really good buffer between the very dense, heavy novels, you know? Uh, The analogy I use is like, um, romance novels are like a good margarita. They're they're quite easy to slam down and they're pretty tasty. (laughs) I can't argue with that. I mean, 
looks like the makings of a romance novel you could write. I mean, somebody's crafting a margarita and, and they have to meet to, to, to fight over tequila or something. That's that's the beauty about the genre is that there's a romance novel for everything. They're so diverse. It's like you're in the baking, boom, there's one for that. You're in the video games, boom, there's one for that as well. So if you don't mind, and I don't want to um to pry too much personally, but I just uh, can you give me an example or would you say in general that decisions that you are making personally or even advice that you're giving to friends or the way that you're kind of computing um, real life relationship stuff has changed or adjusted in some way since you've been reading these books? What I've learned from these books is that they all have like one thing in common and that's like open communication. Um, that's kind of like a reoccurring thing that happens in romance genres is that these two are opening themselves up and that in that way they bring themselves closer. That's something I would say that I've kind of carried on in like interpersonal relationships was just being open, being honest about my feelings. Um, so that way there's no there's no mis misinterpretations or misunderstandings or or anything like that. Because through through reading these books, they can you can kind of get insight into, uh, and I sometimes I think of okay, so say a, 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 a straight man is doesn't have sisters or you know a best girlfriend or you you just don't know how that other mind is working necessarily, and that is what the the misinterpretations, the little you know uh, something that seems like it's no big deal becomes a big deal as somebody's thinking about it, and so it is a little a little peek into the way is somebody opposite of you is working, and you it, I'm sure it can be enlightening and surprising. Oh, for sure, especially in the romance genre. Like I said, it's so diverse. There's so many different like cultures and backgrounds that are getting spot like highlighted that probably wouldn't get highlighted in maybe any other form of media. So you kind of learn a lot about just people in general, honestly, from reading romance novels, because typically, um, typically the romance novels, they're written in their own voices, right? For example, The Kiss Quotient follows a protagonist that has Asperger's, whereas Helen Huang is on the spectrum herself. So you get those personal connections, you get those like small intimate like community details that you wouldn't get unless you are in the community, you know. So there have definitely been times where I'll speak to somebody uh, or whatever, and I'll say like an inside joke or their community. They're like, how'd you read? How'd you know about that? I'm like, from a romance novel. They're like, so. <laughs> And that's fundamentally, I think, what I've always enjoyed about reading and especially about talking about books with other people is it what an incredible gift to be able to step into somebody else's shoes and be in their feelings. I mean, you're essentially feeling their feelings when when you're reading a book and that, I mean, that can change you and you don't have to go through a crisis or a heartache or you don't have to have the experience of a certain population to know, to feel like you, you have more of knowing that comes from the empathy of reading these stories, which is really cool. Oh, definitely. You know, no matter the genre, you know, stories are stories. And uh, if it's a good story, you're definitely going to take something out from it, no matter what mm -hmm. it is. Kim, when you are in your off time and you're not selling books, reading books, reviewing books, recommending books, giving out love advice, you know, um, <laughs> swiping, whatever, left or right, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you have a passion for writing? Do you aspire to write as well? I mean, like anybody that works in a bookstore, writing is definitely a passion of mine for sure. So who knows? In the next few years, you may see a romance novel from yours truly. Got it. There's not a lot of, I mean, do you know of many male authors that are writing romance? So I don't particularly know. See, a lot of people in romance, they use pen names, right? Um, I think it was just recently revealed that Stacey Abrams is actually actually a romance writer that's right these mm -hmm. Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. uh, she goes under Selena Montgomery so you you never know with some of these authors you never know uh, <laughs> my my hope is that there are some male authors out there and hopefully as uh more males are become uh, as more males are reading romance novels and it's becoming start uh more normalized maybe some males can uh, take a crack at it uh, in the writing side so we'll see what's that 
And I'm always fascinated, and I've talked to a few novelists who do write under a pen name, and it's just always so, I mean, how do you pick this name? Because then you're like putting this name out there forever, and you're kind of stuck with it. It seems like a lot of pressure. Uh, so uh, what pen name, do you know how you would go about picking your pen name, you think, Tim, if we're, we're putting out a first romance book? Oh, man, it would definitely have to be somebody whose name I know. I feel like Timothy Syosuma is already like a good pen name. I feel like already people are like, that's not a real name, but who knows? We'll see. <laughs> Too many letters in your last name. How many letters are in your last name? There are 11. 11 letters. So you'd have to be real specific about the font for the cover of your book to get those 11 letters framed with a little bit of space on the side, right? Yeah, hopefully they don't charge by the letter or anything. I don't know how that process works, but if if they charge by the letter, I'm cool with going with Tim X. I feel like Tim X will be a good romance novel name. That would be really good. It's kind of edgy, <laughs> you know, it's kind of surprising. Uh, very last thing, too, before we say goodbye, this uh, podcast we're listening to here of Valentine's Week, coming out of Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. And so uh, I'm sure in your experience reading these romance novels, you've had a couple of takeaways of what guys need to stop doing. We've talked about what they need to be doing, right? Well, we all need to be doing more, more direct communication and openness, but what are some of the traits that you see kind of replayed again and again in these books that dudes just need to know stop? Uh, I think the controlling aspect is something. Uh, I think that's a common criticism about romance books, actually, is that the men are too controlling mm -hmm. in itself. And that's kind of, that may have been a reflection of the times. I think mm -hmm. we're talking about like the the one with the Fabio cover with the 80s. Those one, those yeah. particularly haven't aged well. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think now as we've kind of now that we're in contemporary times, I think guys are starting to be that that's starting to go away, right? That that kind of controlling nature of it, it's starting to be um, a little bit more even even sided. And that's really what, uh, if there's anything I would say to guys, it's just like you know, be open about your feelings, but also be receptive to your partner's feelings or any or and stuff like that. You know, um, you know, help them out, ask them if they're okay. You know, if you get home before them, make dinner and clean up, you know, and vice versa, you know, it's the small things. I think that's what that that's what it all comes down to is those those small little acts of love. You know, you got to show those to, uh, as well as the grand gestures that you typically get in romance novels. Well, I think I'm tearing up. So when people uh, write or, or message on social media and say, um, I'm now in love with Tim and I have to contact him immediately, uh, you want me to tell them you're available or tell them you're unavailable? Oh, yeah. Or your, your boys we'll are offline this. Sure. Yeah, we're available. Why not? Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Oh my God. Well, Tim X, the future romance novelist, a professional a relationship coach, uh, potentially. I mean, you're changing lives right now. I know you are. Um, what an absolute fantastic conversation. I so enjoyed talking to you. And if you do live in Arizona, go to Changing Hands Bookstore at either location and look for Tim's recommendation. And come on, gentlemen, just open yourself up pick up like a work of contemporary uh, romantic fiction. Two thumbs up from Tim. He won't steer you wrong. It's Uncle Tim. Thanks, Tim. Tim. Yeah, I listen to your uncle for sure. Thank you, Olivia, for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, thank you. We usually end the podcast after an author interview with a moment with Margaret, Margaret Stewart's book recommendation time and sometimes uh, a tangent on a reality television show that a book might have inspired us to think about or take a break from reading to indulge in. Uh, but we're not doing that today because Margaret is taking time with her family. And rather, I'd like to use this time to dedicate this podcast episode to Margaret and specifically to Margaret's sister, Liz. The love of reading runs in the family. Liz earned her master's degree in library science and built a beautiful career as a children's librarian. Elizabeth Catherine Stewart passed away on February the 3rd after a long battle with breast cancer and an incredibly courageous fight. Her family by her side, beloved by many. So thinking of you, Margaret, and family and certainly thinking of Liz and sending gratitude to her for all that she shared with not only you, the ones who love 
her so deeply, but for anybody who came in contact with her and maybe was introduced to a book, a passion for reading and escape that was meaningful to them because of the work she was doing. So Margaret, hope to see you soon. I know we will. And thinking of you, Liz, rest in peace. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.